Hi, everybody. It's Bob Ost. This is Friday, and it's March 20. Is it March 22nd, Luke? Is that right? Nod your head. Yeah, it's March 22nd. Um, this is Theater Resources Unlimited, where it's our art services organization. We're dedicated to helping artists and producers all understand and navigate the business of theater. Um, and a uh, funny thing happened in 2020. Actually, on my birthday in 2020, COVID hit and shutdown was declared. Um, and so we didn't know what to do with ourselves. And I was told about Zoom and I kept saying, I don't want to go virtual. Don't make me do this. Don't make me do this. But somebody convinced me to maybe like get a Zoom account. <laughs> so I got a Zoom account. And then I asked people, hey, we're all in quarantine. <laughs> what, do, what are we going to do? You want to get together on like a Friday and, and just meet and talk about stuff? And and I, I got a unanimous yes from all, apparently all across the country because we opened up the Zoom room and started doing this. And my little uh, New York not-for-profit company suddenly was was global. We have people, we actually, oh, every week that we do this now, we have more people from outside of New York than we have from in New York. So um, it's been a, a, a wonderful gift, COVID, the gift that keeps on giving. Um, but it, this has been actually a, a, a positive gift for us. And so we're very happy to be doing this every week. <laughs> and I mean, every week. <laughs> I've been doing this, this is my hundred and, 96 I, you know luke i haven't I, I meant to count before i started i think this is 196 or 97th consecutive monday uh the friday that we've been doing this um so if you're out there and you, and you find your way to, to true um welcome uh, i hope you have a love of theater and and will enjoy the conversations that we have every week and um if you want to be in the room and part of it um email me uh, trunltd at aol.com and we'll invite you every week um, so conversations started off about what do we do now that we're in isolation? Uh, we talked about alternate alternative ways of being creative, of making making theater happen that that didn't require a live performance on a stage. Uh, we talked about literally literally over a hundred of a hundred or more different things. Um, and then in the past two years, we've pretended to come <laughs> we've pretended to come out of quarantine. Um, we pretended that to come back into a new normal. Uh, most of you already know this, but theater is not normal yet. It's just not. Um, we still have struggles and we're still having a problem getting our audiences back, but we can go out into the world. Uh, we don't necessarily have to be masked, although COVID is, has not left us, it's still there. I, I just you know wanna let you know that. So, um, but people, if they get COVID, they don't, you know, it's not as serious as it was. It is serious for some people. So everybody continue to be conscious and and, and um, courteous of, of the people around you. Um, so our conversations have normalized in spite of the fact that theater hasn't. And um, it's always, it's always a challenge for me to find new things to talk about. Um, and today I, I realized that I know a really interesting guy. Um, he's somebody that actually was a playwright in our play reading series uh, many years ago, but still fresh in my mind. Um, and he also happens to be the son of a movie star. And how often do we get to talk to somebody who's been in that situation where they're raised uh, outside the spotlight? I think, uh, Luke, isn't that how you you, you describe it? just outside the, the spotlight. I'm gonna bring him in, this is Luke Yankee. His mom was the magnificent Eileen Heckert, um, extraordinary actress, one of the great treasures of American theater and American film. Um, a woman who had, did win an Oscar, she won an Oscar for uh, a Butterfly, not, not Butterflies of Free, no. Yes, it was, it was butterflies. It was butterflies yeah. free. And she you mean and this she, old thing? That old thing. You have a how many people have an Oscar? Uh, raise your <laughs> hand in the room if you have an Oscar. <laughs> um, and she also won an honorary lifetime achievement Tony Award. We, we can see that old thing now too. <laughs> yeah, there it is. So it's pretty remarkable. Um, but we're not really here to talk about your mom, although that would be a conversation in itself. Um, I want to talk about, I want to talk about you. I want to talk about 
what it was like being raised in the spotlight, it obviously influenced you to go into theater. Um, yes. Were there ever moments where you thought you might not? Were there ever moments where your mother begged you not to? Um, there were those, definitely. There, there was no stopping me as far as I was concerned. But yeah, she tried to talk me out of it because she knew how hard it was. Yes. Yes, it is. It is indeed hard. I think I think everybody in the room will attest to that. So, yes. so talk a little bit, if if you don't mind, just for the for, to start us off. Talk about what it was like um, being a Hollywood kid. Um, well, so first of all, I have to say, you know, you started with your introductions, and I'm so honored to be uh, in the company of so many incredibly talented working writers. It's uh, it's very exciting, and that's something that we, we're you know. Uh, always working on our own at our little computers and in our little cubicles. And so it's, it's very exciting to be uh, in this community. So, so thank you for that gift. Um, so when I was a kid, my mother was working mostly on Broadway and uh, she came out to the West Coast to do lots of film and television. She was doing a lot of television at that time in particular, but um, she was, when I was young, she was mostly doing things on Broadway like uh, Butterflies Are Free um, and uh, a number of Barefoot in the Park and, and a number of plays like that. So, um, you know, she did her best to make it seem like a normal childhood. <laughs> Good luck with that. But but um, uh, she and my father were married for 53 years, which is kind of unusual in, in any walk of life, let alone in show business. And uh, he was a saint, my father. He was just an extraordinary man and very, very patient with all us crazy theater people. And um, we also had a Scottish nanny who was with our family for 35 years. And uh, to the day she died, she had an accent you could cut with a knife. And she used to say, I'm your mommy's understudy. Um, <laughs> That'll never happen. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, uh, but you know, meaning her understudying being a mother. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, it, it was this crazy sort of anti-mame kind of background where uh, Ethel Merman taught me how to make a martini when I was 10. Uh, Paul Newman gave me acting lessons in the living room. Uh, he taught me how to upstage my co-star in children's theater. I loved him for that. And I um, uh, also, I was fielding calls from reporters at 13, the night my mother won the Academy Award. So uh, I think I was somewhere around seven or eight before I realized that not all the kids in school sat around on Saturday night watching mom on uh, Gunsmoke or uh, the Mary Tyler Moore show. You know, it was just normal for me. That was kind of what we did. So it just seemed natural that I would go into this business. And as I said, you know, my mother did try to discourage me at first, but then when she realized there was no stopping me, uh, she was very supportive. How did you find your way from um, acting? Because I, I know you you have acted, right? You, yes. You were, yes. Was that the original? Was that the, your original goal, or did you know that you was wanted the original to be a goal? Yes, I I got my equity card at fifteen and. Um, uh, doing children's theater in the basement of the YMCA and all of that, and then um, uh, studied acting at Juilliard, and really uh, started, then I started directing, and when I started directing, Bob, I really felt like I was wearing shoes that fit for the first time, and for a number of years, I was going, we were living in Connecticut, and I was going back and forth between uh, assistant directing on Broadway. Uh, I was mentored by Hal Prince and I was his assistant on a show called Grind with Ben Vereen and Stubby K and uh, Leilani Jones. And then I worked with Ellis Rabb. I worked with Jerry Friedman, uh, Brian Murray. And for a number of years there, I was kind of going back and forth between doing my own things in church basements or wherever they will have me and assisting on Broadway and, and temping on Wall Street the entire time to sort of keep a roof over my head. <laughs> and then from there, it, I just sort of segued into writing. And then um, once again, you know, that really has been uh, has been very good to me and is really what I've been focusing on for the past. I still direct, certainly, but uh, and still act from time to time, but really been focusing primarily on the writing for at least. Well, gosh, my play was in the TRU Voices program back in 2010. And I remember that was one of my first plays to get any sort of recognition. And I remember getting the the letter from you saying that that uh, I was going to be in the program. I was so excited about that. We were pretty so, excited too. It, it was uh, it was really really thrilling. And so you sort of helped launch things. Oh my room. goodness, that's a that's a lot. I had no idea. Um, 
it, it's interesting. Your path is so similar to Austin Pendleton. I I In interviewed world. Austin um, about two months ago. I interviewed him, yes. and we stopped video. <laughs> and uh, the the thrust of that was balancing act. I mean, my my conversation with him was really about how do you balance the three, which is not a conversation I was expecting to have with you, but I think that it's relevant. Um, well, so so what you're saying so far is that you started off acting up because it just seemed like the natural first step because of your mom. Um, then you found your way into directing, which is exactly what happened to him. And right. then you started writing. I don't know why it happens. Why does it happen in that order? Well, the the other thing that I'm doing, just speaking of balancing, and and I know that so many people in your audience, as as I heard, uh, are you know wearing a lot of different hats and and spinning all the plates in the air. But I'm also uh, the head of playwriting at Cal State Fullerton, and um, teaching five classes this semester. So so teaching five classes while directing and writing is it, it's a lot to balance. But um, hey, you know we all do what we love because we don't know how to do anything else. I guess that's why I'm still here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for explaining this to me. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Um, so um, do you have a, do you, have, well, I think if I'm hearing, if I'm intuiting correctly from what you're saying or extrapolating, acting became the least satisfying part, uh, part of it for you. Yes, definitely. So, so can you tell me a little bit about what it was about directing that made you feel like it fit better? Well, for one Those thing- Those comfortable well, shoes. Yes, um, for one thing, I mean, even though my mother's last name in the business was Heckert and my last name is Yankee, it's a pretty unique last name. So uh, when I would go into auditions, a lot of casting directors, et cetera, would know that I was the son of. And as a result of that, I felt like there was a greater pressure on me um to be as good as my mother <laughs> and oh, uh, when, when those are big I, those are big shoes well they are especially when one is about you know 24 25 it i mean those are... extraordinary extraordinary yeah. uh, creator of characters she yes. wasn't Aileen Heckert and everything you saw her in she was very uniquely a character she, she was yeah. very good at that yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, and also one of the things that um, that I talk about in, in my latest play, Marilyn Mom and Me, which I'm sure we'll get to, is that from the time I was uh, 11 years old and doing children's theater in the basement of the YMCA, as I mentioned earlier, my mother would usually come to a run through of one of my performances and she would critique me like I was Laurence Olivier at the Old Vic. And, and I knew it was to make me tougher and to make me a better actor. But, you know, at age at, at that age, when one is hearing, what the fuck were you doing up on that stage? I mean, it's it, it was tough. It, it was tough. And again, I know it was done with love and with the best of intentions. But um, there were times I just kind of wanted a supported mom to, to tell me I was good. And so I think that was part of the, the, all of those reasons combined were kind of what led me into, uh, into directing. And the way I started assisting on Broadway was, it's kind of an amazing story. Um, I was at, uh, my mother was part of what I call the Connecticut Mafia. Uh, and so there was Colleen Dewhurst and George C. Scott, you know, all those people who lived up in that neck of the woods, uh, Teresa Wright, Robert Anderson, who were all dear family friends. And we were at a Christmas party at Ann Baxter's house. And my mother was uh, uh, in the corner with this woman just chattering up a storm for hours. And it was someone I didn't recognize. And, and I, I knew it was someone in the business. And so I kind of wormed my way into their conversation. And this very direct, very tough looking lady turns to me and says, your mother tells me you're very talented. Do you sing? And I thought, I would better not screw this up. So I said, yes, I sing. She said, well, you'll have to come in and sing for Hal and me in the new year. Well, was, that, it was, was it Ruth Mitchell? Mitchell? It was, Ruth it, was. Mitchell. Mitchell. it was Ruth Mitchell, who was Hal Prince's right hand person for 40 plus years. And uh, the, so she arranged what was a courtesy audition for me the next week to go in and, and sing for her on the stage of the 46th Street Theater for Grind, Hal's new musical. 
And so, uh, you know, I, I said, Ruth, I I'm so grateful to you for making time for me. I realize you're already cast, but if you ne ever need a gopher, a coffee boy, anything like that, I'm also very interested in directing and other aspects of the business. I hope you'll keep me in mind. So a week later, I got a call saying, how'd you like to work for Hal Prince for the next two months for free? I was like, yes, sign me up. <laughs> and that was what got me launched in directing. And Hal was an incredible mentor to me for the rest of the rest of his life. He was really very dear and very, very special to me. We can't do that today. We have to we have to pay minimum wage. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that not a bad, not a bad experience. Um, I actually and, wrote it. I wrote in a cab, a, a, not a cab. It was a, a, like a limo with uh, Hal Prince and Ruth Mitchell um, from um, the opening of a show at the Zellerbach Theater at the University of Pennsylvania, where I was the house manager. Um, to a restaurant where we were, they were having a cast party. I was terrified of her. <laughs> I was <laughs> terrified of her. She could be pretty intense, yeah, but she was dear to me, as was Hal. Oh, well, that was my only brush with them. You had knew them a little bit better, I think. <laughs> um, so so let's talk about uh, the the move from, from directing to to acting. I, I still, I'm not sure that you, you really gave me the answer I was looking for in terms of what is it about directing that you find more, more, more comfortable? Um, as a director, one is looking at the whole picture where as an actor, one has to have such tunnel vision. And maybe it has to do with the fact that I'm a control freak or <laughs> maybe it just has to do with the fact that I'm good at kind of seeing the bigger picture. Um, so, I just, uh, I don't, like I said, I just, uh, I felt like I was just, I'd come home once I started directing. Well, I, from from my experience, uh, directing is the big picture, but it's also more detailed. And don't. there's a lot, you have to be, you're in, you're, you are in control of a lot of moving parts. You don't necessarily have to be a control freak because you want to be, but you do have to be controlling to make sure yeah. that everything happens when it's supposed to happen. And that everybody's also having the same vision. Exactly. And and one of the things that it took me a while to learn since I didn't formally study directing was just learning how to speak everyone else's language. I mean, the first couple of times that I would go into meetings with designers, I would be terrified because I would think, OK, if I say the wrong thing or if I don't you know, convey what I want properly, this is going to cost a lot of money and this is going to affect the budget. So, um, you know, just learning that uh, while a director may see a scene as angry and intense, a designer may see it as jagged and crimson, but you're saying the same thing just with different words. Um, I actually don't want to forget because there's a couple of questions that already popped up. Somebody wants to know, did your mom talk about working with theatrical writers? I'm not sure what that means. Um, did you, sure. uh, oh, did she? Oh, well, she, yeah. Did she ever talk about talking with writers? I mean, her experience with writers. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, one of my favorite stories is that one of the things she did fairly early on was uh, the original Broadway production of uh, "A View from the Bridge," and um, it was directed by Arthur Penn uh, before he went on to do films like Norma Ray and so many incredible things. And um, this was Arthur Miller after Arthur Miller had, you know, done Death of a Salesman and was just the toast of Broadway. And so uh, my mother was playing Beatrice, the wife. And uh, there was one time when mom went to uh, Arthur Penn and said, um, uh, no, or was it Martin Ritt? I think it was Arthur Penn. Anyway, um, uh, she went to the director and said, I, I just don't think my character would would say this line. And he said, well, what do you want me to do about it? It's like, well, I, I want you to ask Arthur Miller if he could, if I could change the line. It's like, you can't ask Arthur Miller to change a line. And he was there sitting in the back of the theater. So she said, watch me. So she marched up the aisle. Uh, uh, and by now she's getting kind of nervous thinking, oh, Arthur's such a shy man and I don't want to offend this great playwright. And so she sat down next to him back in row Q and said, um, Arthur, about this line on page 47, I, I just don't think Beatrice would say that. And I just want to get your opinion about it. And he was a little taken aback. He said, well, show me the line. So she put her script in his lap and he chewed on his pencil for a moment. And he said, fine, what would you like to say instead? And that to me is the mark of a great playwright that he knew the actress playing the role would have gotten inside the skin of the character in perhaps a different way than he had. And so he had no ego about saying, great, what do you want to say instead? Uh, and I so, so which line stayed in the script? 
Yes. Mm -hmm. her, her line stayed in the script? Yes, it did. Yes. Okay. It, yeah. So I, I just always loved that story. And I, I think it speaks volumes about Arthur Miller. <laughs> Another question from Jeff is, um, did you ever talk about the bad seed with her? Yes. Yes, we did. And, and in how, fact, old, I, how old were you when you had that conversation? <laughs> uh, there were several of them over the years. In fact, uh, if you'll forgive me for some shameless self-promotion, my memoir is called Just Outside the Spotlight, Growing Up with Eileen Heckert. And I've got a whole chapter on the bad seed. Um, and basically, um, for those of you who might not be aware, it's about a, a little girl who was a murderer, murderess, uh, long before anything like that was popular, because this was in the early 50s. I mean, it was really groundbreaking in that regard. And my mother plays the yeah, alcoholic. She, th th this one didn't need Shucky. She did it on her own. Absolutely. And my mother played the alcoholic mother of uh, a little boy that the girl had killed. And she suspects it, so she keeps coming to the house and she's drunk in each scene. And the little boy's name was Claude Daigle. And uh, at the time that she did that, um, my brother Mark was about eight or nine years old, which was the same age as Claude Daigle in the play. And so even though she was not that sort of method actress, she started seeing my brother Mark's face every night as the face of her child who'd been killed. And as she's mourning him, you know, she's getting really, really upset. Uh, it reached a point where she would start getting depressed at four o'clock in the afternoon. By the time she got to the theater at night, she was a nervous wreck and wouldn't speak to anybody. And so uh, finally, you know, my father insisted that she go to a doctor and um, she didn't believe in psychiatrists. So I think she went to the family GP and explained the situation. And uh, he said, well, it's obvious what you have to do. You have to give up this play. And she said, well, I'm getting the reviews of my career. I got a Tony nomination. I can't leave a hit play. And he said, you're asking me what to do to overcome this deep depression. And what I'm telling you is you need to leave this play. So it was the only time she had a year's contract and it was the only time in her career that she actually broke her contract. And then when she did the film, because of the concentrated aspect of filmmaking, it was just a few days and she sort of sucked it up and dealt with it. Uh, but, um, uh, but it took a, a profound toll on her. And it's one of the only roles I know that, uh, that ever had that impact. And it kind of shows in her performance because she won the Golden Globe and was nominated for an Academy Award. Um, so I've got another one from Kate Catcher. I usually don't start the questions early, but they're, they're coming in. Um, she wants to know what are the what are your favorite types of plays to direct, or how do you decide that you want to direct a play? Um, how do gosh. you pick them? <laughs> well, at the moment, I'm directing a lot of my own things, <laughs> so that's kind of where where I'm at at the moment. But um, uh, you know, it's just something that I relate to. Just there, there is no sort of. I mean, I've directed comedies, I've directed dramas. There really isn't. Uh, isn't any real criteria. It's just something that I feel speaks to me. I, I know that's not a, a very specific answer, Kate, but that's that's kind of the way it works. Okay. Well, I'm going to pull us. I'm going to pull us back to the, um, the the questions that I was thinking about asking. Um, so uh, let's let's talk about the move from directing into writing. Um, what made you think that you could write a play or did you not? A lot of us sit down and we don't, we don't, the first time I wrote a play, I had no idea I could do it. I just sat down at a typewriter and started. Same with me. Same with me. And, and in fact, I had a writing partner on my first play because I didn't trust myself as a writer. And the more confident I became, and he's a wonderful writer in his own, in his own regard, but um, uh, there was a lot of sparring because the more confident I became, and he was already a confident writer, uh, I realized that I didn't need a writing partner. And so from the, then on out, I've pretty much worked on my own. I, I realized, you know, I, I've certainly written some television scripts and all of that, and I know that's all about collaboration, of course. But, uh, but in terms of plays, I really, it was very much trial and error, and I just kind of sat down and, and started doing it. Okay, so... Um... Let's let's move to to the 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 play the 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 topic that I would I wanted to actually explore, which is right. how do you how do you take like this is true of documentary or it's true of anything. It isn't specific to you so much, but you have specific a specific way into this whole idea, which is how do you take real events and dramatize them? 
how much objectivity do you bring to it? Um, and before the current one, it's the Marilyn Monroe piece. What, what, tell me the title again. Marilyn, Mom, and Me. Marilyn, Mom, and Me. I think you've used life experiences before in, in your plays as well, ha or have you? Not as much as this. I have to, to a lesser extent, uh, kind of themes, but... Um, but but this one is uh, is extremely autobiographical, and um, uh, you know I I set out to write a play about my mother and Marilyn Monroe because my mother played Marilyn's best friend in the film A Bus Stop, and at the time Marilyn was the quintessential method actress, and I don't need to explain to your audience what that means. But she had taken the year off the year before she did Bus Stop to uh, to study at the actor studio. And since she had become the poster child for the method, uh, and since my mother was playing her best friend, Marilyn felt that she had to make my mother her best friend. And at first, mom was like, okay, who's this starlet who's glomming onto me and making me feel very uncomfortable? But then the two of them wound up really bonding through their wounds. And neither one of them, they were both adopted. And so neither one of them, for all they both achieved, ever really felt like they deserved a place at the table. So, and my mother had two sets of stories she would tell about Marilyn. One was about this woman who would come to the set late, unprofessional, not knowing her lines because she was so busy schmoozing with the gossip columnists. And the other one, if you really pressed her, uh, she would be very dismissive and wouldn't want to talk about Marilyn. But if you really pressed her, within a matter of moments, she would burst into tears. And she would talk about this woman who uh, never really believed that she was loved, never felt that she was enough, and was so desperate to have a child. So those are some of the elements I cover in the play. And the crazy thing about it, Bob, is that I set out to write a play about my mother and Marilyn, and I wound up writing a play about my mother and me. <laughs> because the uh, the framework that I, I landed on is that uh, I had heard bits and pieces of a lot of her stories. And so I spent a lot of time uh, really delving into them and studying a lot of uh, biographies of Marilyn and saying, oh, that's a similarity. Oh, I'd never thought of that. And so in the play, uh, a 40 something Luke learns early on that his mother is dying of terminal cancer, which was true. And so he is trying to get at some truths about their relationship before his mother passes by unraveling her very complex relationship with Marilyn Monroe. So the play works on a lot of different levels and kind of goes back and forth between a 30-something Eileen on the set with Marilyn uh, the set, on the set of Bus Stop in 1956 and, um, and Eileen in the last year of her life with Luke in, uh, in the year 1999. And I am really exposed in this play. I really kind of go there. It's very raw in that regard. And um, I really depict very honestly this very complex mother-son relationship with this woman who was very loving yet extremely critical and extremely caustic and yet is doing the best she can because she never truly believed that she was loved herself. So in the course of the play, the Luke character realizes how could she give what she never had? So let me ask you this. This is a hypothetical. Sure. If you had written this play earlier, uh, would your perspective have been different? Um, totally. has, how has your perspective changed over the years and, and what has changed it? Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. And it's taken me a long time to forgive my mother. Uh, I loved her very much, and I know she loved me very much, but it took me a long time and a lot of therapy to see where the tough love was coming from. You, you kind of and, encapsulated with, what were you doing on that stage? You yeah. can't, it's like that you set the tone for that, like at the beginning of our conversation. It's like, yes. all right, here we are. So we've yeah. come full, we've actually come full circle to this. So, um, well, yeah, for, I mean, just philosophically, I, I believe in the importance of forgiveness. And I, I do believe that we, yeah, I agree. It's forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. It really is. Um, to let go of, let go of the things that are burdening you, um, well, it helps you. <laughs> 
Absolutely. And uh, the play, I'm very pleased to say that um, because it's so raw and so deeply personal, I think that's why people are relating to it the way they are. Uh, it won the Stanley Award uh, in 2002, which is uh, some of your uh, audience members know, I'm sure they give one of those a year. And some of the past recipients include Terrence McNally, Jonathan Larson, Adrian Kennedy. So I was really honored to be in such incredible company. And um, it just had its world premiere at the uh, professional theater here in Long Beach, California, near where I live, just closed about a month ago, as a matter of fact, and sold out houses, broke box office records, standing ovations at every performance, uh, had a couple of Broadway producers come and check it out. And there's a lot of interest in it for New York, I'm happy to say. How in heaven's name did you find somebody to play Marilyn and somebody to play Eileen? And, and how did you cast yourself? <laughs> Those are all very good questions. Um, the Marilyn was recommended to me, and she's a woman named Alicia Soper, who is Ryan Murphy's go-to person for Marilyn, and she is phenomenal. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that most people who've seen the play or who saw one of the Zoom presentations that we, I, I did a, a Zoom benefit of it uh, during COVID um, for the Actors Fund, and um, a lot of people say she's the best Marilyn they have ever seen, bar none. I mean, she's really phenomenal. And the actress who played Eileen is an actress named Laura Gardner, wonderful regional theater actress, does a lot of work here on the West Coast, a lot of film and television work. And one of my plays was being done at the Last Frontier Theater Conference in Alaska several years ago. And uh, I saw Laura do a reading of something and I was like, she could play mom. And I just had the idea for the play at the time. And so I mentioned it to her. And the minute I got home from the festival, she started pummeling we, with me with emails saying, when are you sending me the play? When are you sending it? Like, Laura, I haven't written it yet. Give me a break. So, so I, and oh, the that. Actor, oh, that little detail. Yeah, really. <laughs> uh, but it gave me some good incentive to write it. And then the actor who plays me is an actor named Brian Rohan, who uh, is a friend of mine here on the West Coast. He's an Emmy-winning actor who's done a lot of great work. And um, so uh, it, it was just, it was it was a love fest from start to finish. You make it sound like your casting was like a just shopping. It's, I'll take one of those, one of those, and one of those. And, <laughs> but honestly, you must have seen like dozens of people or- Or, or, those or, roles, or, did, or, or did you just, you just had it precast when you were ready to do it? For those it. roles, I did not. I had it precast. And then when I, uh, there's a, an actress who plays um, uh, Rosetta Lenoir, who ran a Moss repertory theater for years, was the founder of Amos, who was my mother's best friend. And the same actress also plays Ella Fitzgerald because Marilyn was very instrumental in uh, in Ella's career. And so- Marilyn Monroe was? Yes, yes. And Tell how, I had no idea. Briefly, um, Ella could not get booked into first rate clubs. And when Marilyn started doing movie musicals, her coach at the time was telling her about this new thing the kids listen to called jazz and told her that, said to Marilyn, you need to learn about phrasing. And I, your homework is I want you to listen to Ella Fitzgerald's Gershwin album 100 times. And so Marilyn did and became obsessed with Ella and went to see her at every second rate club where she was playing and was trying to get her booked in bigger clubs and they wouldn't give her the time of day. So Marilyn went to the owner of the Macombo uh, who basically said, well, she's not right for our clientele. So he's like, well, because she's black, no. It's like, well, she doesn't have your dimensions. And Marilyn said, so in other words, you're telling me Ella Fitzgerald is too fat to play the Macombo. And the owner of the club said, if you want to put it bluntly, yes. She said, I will make a deal with you. If you book Ella Fitzgerald for 10 nights, I will buy a ringside table and every night I will fill it with the biggest stars in town. And I will be there myself every night that I can. So the run was sold out for the publicity alone. Uh, it was the run was uh, Ella's uh, contract was extended for another 10 days. Of course, she brought the house down and, uh, and Ella Fitzgerald never had to play a second rate club again. So I tell that story in the play and have a couple of scenes of, uh, of an actress playing uh, Ella. And I contacted this guy out here on the West Coast who is uh, an authority on Ella Fitzgerald and was written a couple of books about her, uh, written a, a pretty definitive biography. And I said, uh, Jeffrey, um, do, you, you know, do you have any idea when that happened at the Macombo? 
And he got this sort of Cheshire cat grin on his face. And he said, it happened during the shooting of Bus Stop. And your mother was one of the guests at the Macombo. Oh. So, of course, that story is in the play. Because I had no idea. I, I was absolutely gobsmacked when he told me that. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Um, wow. I thought so. Um, I thought of something I wanted to ask you when you were talking and, and uh, being a terrible host because I'm, I'm not, not no I'm, I'm being was. a terrible guest because I'm probably talking too much no that's your that's your job <laughs> okay that's your job really um what was something? oh yes I wanted to ask you how many characters are in your play total five five oh, that's, so that's... there's there's Ella Fitzgerald um uh well the the actress who plays Rosetta and Ella um the same actress also plays Paula Strasberg uh, Marilyn, Eileen, Luke, and another actor who plays a variety of roles. He plays Joshua Logan, who is the director of Bus Stop. Uh, he plays Arthur Miller. He plays a couple of different studio executives. He plays the owner of the Macombo. So, you know, I've been doing this long enough that I know to make it very producible. So it's five actors in one unit set. And how many understudies would it require? Well, that's the thing that's a little tricky because, you know, you'd need to have three female understudies. So, uh, four understudies. Yeah, right. that's the part that's a little tricky, be, that, you know, um, because you can't have the same person understudying Ella Fitzgerald and Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Or Marilyn and Eileen, for that matter. Yeah, really, yeah. Um, I always make it a point to to uh, mention understudies because uh, writers don't remember that. They, they don't think about that. No, um, I, I, I've, I've thought of all of those things. Good for you. <laughs> You're a producer's dream. Good for you. Well, I've I've been a producer. I've run two regional theaters, and since I've been a producer, I just you know which hat am I wearing this time? How? Uh, when did you start producing? At what point was that something that came into your life? Uh I ran a summer theater in northwestern Pennsylvania, the Struthers Library Theater, this gorgeous thousand seat opera house in northwestern Pennsylvania, and that was around 1991, I believe. And then uh, was there for two years. And then I moved to the West Coast and to pursue film and television work. And within a year, found myself running the Long Beach Civic Light Opera, uh, which was one of the biggest musical theaters in the country at the time. And uh, and that's where I worked with the fabulous Carol Weiss, who is in your audience today. Yay, yeah, Carol. <laughs> and uh, in fact, the, the way I got that job at Long Beach, I, I mean, I was definitely a long shot. Nobody knew who I was on the West Coast. And so I was there was it was down to three finalists. And I thought, OK, I better pull out the big guns. So I put down Hal Prince as one of my recommendations. And so the head of the search committee called the office and Hal's assistant said, I will tell him, but he's in rehearsal for three shows at once right now. Do not hold your breath for a callback. So she understood. Then 20 minutes later, the phone rang and he said, to say nice things about Luke Yankee, I'm getting out of rehearsal. Hire him. And that's how I got the job where I wound up meeting my life partner of 29 years, Don Hill, so uh, who was actually a, a wonderful producer and a director and currently the head of the, uh, of the chair of drama at UC Irvine out here on the West Coast. And shortly before Hal died, I wrote him uh, when Prince of Broadway was being done and I wanted to congratulate him. And I said, you know, Hal, I don't know that I ever told you this, but I owe my marriage to you. <laughs> and he was very touched and sent me back a, a lovely email. Um, let me ask you this then. Prior to your first, um, the, the North Pennsylvania place, um, did you have much awareness of what goes into producing a show? Yes. Um, yes, I because I had been directing enough for uh, by that time and had directed things in summer stock and, you know, up on the Cape and, and various places. And so, sure. And, and having, you know, having grown up in the biz, I mean, I, I went to my first Broadway opening at age nine. And uh, of course, uh, which was Butterflies Are Free. Uh, and a lot of um, so it's nice that my first one was a hit. Um, but sure. So a lot of mom's friends were producers and directors and all. So I, I just sort of, you know, at, at cocktail parties when I was a little boy, I would just kind of sit at their feet and soak up these stories like a sponge. A and, of, you know, a lot of the people that in, in our community, a lot of actors and, and, and writers um, for years, I've, I've been doing this for 30 years now. Um, 
for years, nobody wanted to understand the business. It was very frustrating. That was that was my my mission was to get people to stop resisting the business side of of things and just understand it better. I don't think I don't think understanding the business uh, in, infects or affects your ability to to be a um, a creative person. Um, and I, I think a lot of people are afraid that the practical considerations really will outweigh their creative talent or something. I don't think that's true. I, I I think it can I think it can happen. I think some people can can misunderstand um, what's what we're asking to them to do. We're asking them to be aware of how the business works. That's all. We're not asking Absolutely. them to do things differently. But once you understand how the business works, does it affect how you do things? You know, Bob, I I would say I think it makes it better. Um, because for instance, you know, one thing, uh, just really from the, and I know you teach a lot of seminars and things like this, just the nuts and bolts of playwriting. Uh, I mean, if you have a character, uh, if you have a play in this day and age with more than five characters, you're probably not going to get produced outside of a university period, end of story, because the economics are just too expensive. I mean, if you write, like to write plays with 20, 30 characters or even 10 or 15, unless it's a big musical that's a, a different story and and even there and but you know god bless you i have a play about the aftermath of the sinking of the titanic uh called the last lifeboat um and it has had 60 amateur productions around the country and i would love for it to have a professional production but it's about the sinking of the titanic it's a big cast you can't tell that story with five people and so as a result, it's done a lot at colleges and community theaters and and places that want casts with big shows. And, you know, if that's the kind of thing you want to write, more power to you. You just need to know that because of the economics, it's limited to where it's going to get produced. So you know, I, I do. I do try to let people understand that they 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 don't they can write anything they want, uh, anything that their heart tells them to write. They simply have to understand what the potential markets are for that and not assume that everything that they write is going to go to a commercial production. There are, there are other mar markets. So thank you for saying that because that's well, what I, we've been teaching for 30 years. Well, it, it's interesting. And and one of the actresses in Marilyn Mom and Me was like, oh, I don't read reviews. It's it's going to affect my performance. Well, I respect that. And I, I can see how if you're the type of, of artist who, you know, reading a review is going to throw you or is going to sway you or even if it's like oh it, it's that that they mention a wonderful moment and now you're self-conscious about that wonderful moment i never felt that way and my mother never felt that way uh, i always read reviews and as a director i feel like i have to read reviews because i know how it's going to affect the box office or not and as a director and certainly as a producer i need to know that you know um, so that's just another example, but, um, to some extent with actors, I can understand it, but I always want to know what they're saying about me out there. I, it's just, it, you know, it's just the way I, the way I roll. A friend, a dear friend of mine, uh, and the, she was the actress and I was the playwright when we were growing up in our teens. She, uh, she came to New York and she actually got a, a part in a, a play off Broadway and Michael Feingold, and he became a friend of mm -hmm. mine, gave her a review and called her per performance a perfect performance. And she yeah. threw up every night after that. Bless her heart. She could not get out. She could not bring herself to go out on that stage without throwing up first. So there was a there was a wonderful character actress who, because of the nature of this story, who will remain nameless, was a good friend of my mom's. And when she would get a bad review, she would actually write the critic and say, "Thank you so much. I'll try to do better in the future." Now I think that's a little extreme. I love that actually. <laughs> Guilt them into the next review. Kind of. <laughs> uh, so, um, you when did you write the your, your uh, the autobiography out just outside the, the Marilyn Mom and me or, or no, the, no, the just, memoir? Yeah, yeah, the memoir. When did you write that? Oh gosh, I believe that first came out around two thousand six. Yes. Okay, so this is this is eighteen years later. Mm -hmm. um, would you have done? Would you have said things in a different way now? Actually, I did a. Um, uh, I was when I was requested about. Well, actually, it was during COVID to do a uh, a paperback edition 
um, I added some new material and I did kind of a postscript where I talked about it because it kind of goes up to my mother's death. And so I talked about the enduring legacy and, and, you know, me trying to keep her image alive and which is why I've written some of the things that I have. And, um, uh, so yes, I, I would have written certain things differently, but I was very careful. My mother never wanted to write a book herself and she never wanted me to write one because somewhere in the back of her mind, she was afraid I was going to write Mommy Dearest. Well, in the first place, we did not have that kind of relationship, you know, nor would nor would I have wanted that to be the kind of book I have, uh, I, you know, I would write about her. And yet, you know, while Marilyn Mom and Me is sort of warts and all, it ultimately does not paint her in a negative picture. Uh, again, nor would I do that. And it's very much, it's very much about a, a son trying to come to terms with his compl complicated relationship with a difficult parent. And I think that's the reason so many people are relating to it because who among us didn't have a difficult time with one parent or another, or perhaps a sibling or something like that? I, I think it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it's something that uh, that a lot a lot of people can relate to. Well, you talked about earlier on. You said that forgiveness is a gift to give yourself, <clears throat> and you talked that as uh, mentioned that as a, a, a way that you were able to reach the point of being able to to, to write this play. I, I think um, mm -hmm. so. Is there anything in the autobiography, in the uh, memoir, that you might look at differently now that you've you've come to a different place of forgiveness, of greater forgiveness? I think you were probably at a place of forgiveness back then too. Yes, one of the things I had to do, Bob, when I was writing the memoir was uh, I talked about those those difficult critiques, and and the, I have a whole chapter called "What Were You Diva. Doing Up There?" Yeah, yeah, and I have a whole chapter <laughs> called "The Diva Critiques." <laughs> and, and, and kind of a parody of an actor prepares. And so, so when I was writing that chapter, the first thing I had to do is I had to sit down and get out all the anger and just say to myself, you know, just kind of almost like, you know, automatic writing or journaling where, you know, how could you say that to me when I was a fragile little kid and blah, 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 blah. And, and so I wrote all of that and then I went, okay, when she said X comment to you at when you were playing King Arthur and Camelot at age 12, if there was a good intention behind it, what would that have been? And I did a lot of soul searching to really find out what those good intentions were. And again, as I said, it was about making me tougher, about preparing me for the business. It sure as hell prepared me for Juilliard because boy, <laughs> uh, because I was a Juilliard in the era when it was like, okay, you know you're talented. That's why you got in here. You will never hear this again. Now we're going to tell you exactly how and why your shit stinks. <laughs> you know? So those really tough critiques prepared me for Juilliard, if nothing else. I think, I, you know, excuse me. What I'm, what I was, what I'm thinking of a little bit is that it may have been a way of her maybe she, do you think she wanted you to go into show business you said she didn't did she i don't think so at first i don't think so and but then it was like okay if you're going to do this i'm going to treat you like I, th there was a moment and and i showed this scene in marilyn mom and me she's like now we can you know she comes to the run through of seeing me as king arthur in camelot at age 12 and <laughs> she's like and you, now, you were you were amazing i'm sure at 12 how amazing yeah. could i be i mean frankly but um <clears throat> but she's like no we can handle this one of two ways i have a lot of notes but i will only give them if you want me to otherwise i can just show up and with your father on opening night and be a supportive parent uh but you know or i can tell you things to make me make you better the choice is up to you and i thought a long time knowing this was a really important decision a real turning point in my life and i said I want to be better. And then all hell broke loose. <laughs> so you brought and, it on yourself. <laughs> well, but she made it very clear. I mean, about 10 minutes later, when I was crying very heavily, she was like, look, I'm not saying this to, to be mean. I'm saying this to make you a better actor. 
And I sort of wiped away the tears and said, okay, I get it, go on. And so in a sense, I asked for it because I knew it was with my best interest in mind. But, you know, at age 12, you don't always see that. Okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, open up to the room. Uh, Ross, do, are there any other questions that are waiting to be asked? And, and I want to encourage everybody, you know, talk to, talk to us now. This is an opportunity for you. If you want to turn on your, your mic, uh, you can turn on your mic and, and just ask a question or make a comment. Um, yeah, so there, let me see. Ross plays the, the, the voice of God. Of course, yeah. love that. Yes, I do. Uh, yeah, um, what are your favorite types of plays to direct? Uh, I think somebody already yeah. asked me. Asked yeah, me did we that. ask that? Okay, yeah, I thought yes, we stopped. Yes, thank you. My bad. No, um, that's okay. Then after that, uh, who do you see playing you in the play? In your, in your dream casting. My dream casting, because <laughs> it's a 40-something me, would be and you know there's i i've i'm working on the screenplay as well so maybe this would be more for the movie but hey i can dream and have this be on broadway um either eddie redmayne or andrew garfield eddie redmayne that's a daring choice <laughs> i think he I, he's a brilliant actor i think he'd be incredible yeah, yeah he is he is <clears throat> next up let me see um that it you know no, no, uh, no i'm looking at uh, uh, patrick julie, o'leary I'm, I'm seeing a comment from julie here saying this is so important took over 40 years of therapy to forgive my mom so healing lovely conversation julie i i, I hope june, you don't mind june, I, actually june i'm sorry i don't have my glasses on june i hope you don't mind that i i shared that but no um, not at all one, one time after the play since it's you know very recent um somebody came up to me afterwards and said are you in therapy? <laughs> and I said, I used to be. Now I write plays about it instead. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just, just um, I can share. That my, my mother was a par uh, uh, paranoid schizophrenic. I'm so sorry. And but but 40 years when I forgave her, the world opened up. Yes. So your yes. words are so powerful, and it just helps. People need to know that that when you forgive them, the world starts to work. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, if I may share something briefly, my mother did the original production of Kenneth Lonergan's The Waverly Gallery, <laughs> um, and it was the last thing she did. And she produced, said, produced by my friend Randall Riggett. Exactly. To, I, want to get I know Randall, Randall Riggett as well, mentioned. of course, of course. But, um, and she had said she, that it was the role of her career and that it was going to be her swan song. <clears throat> and uh, at age, uh, just before she turned 82, she won more awards for a single performance in a single season than any actress in theater history. And when she was doing that play, when she was in rehearsals for it, and it's, a, for those of you who don't know, it's about a woman's descent into Alzheimer's. Mm. And it's written the way an Alzheimer's patient speaks. So everyone was dependent upon her for their cues, but she would have like three pages of nonsense at a clip. She nearly had a nervous breakdown trying to learn it. And when she did that play, she was very much the lion in winter. And I saw how vulnerable and fragile she was. And, you know, it had been years of therapy and years of coming to terms with everything I've been talking about, but it feels like, of course it wasn't, but it feels like there was one morning I woke up and said to myself, she's not gonna be around much longer and it's mm. time to forgive her. And so, once I did, as you said, June, the freedom I felt was just incredible. And so after the Waverly Gallery closed, she was gone within a year. Wow. Because yeah. she said, this is my swan song. That I, I want to go out in a, all, with a bang. And boy, she did. Was, was yeah. that the year that she also won the Lifetime Tony? Yes. Yes. Wow. She, yeah. Mm -hmm. She won the Lifetime Tony in 2000, I believe, and died in... To, no, in 2001, and then she died in 2002. Wow. Yeah. Love to talk to you some more about this sometime. <laughs> well, right. you know, maybe we'll we'll hang out after after this. Yeah. Um, so the next, uh, Patrick O'Leary, do you want to turn your uh, sound on and just ask your question? No? Hey, Luke, yeah, no. But the question was, how did... Um, 
the Inch Center slash festival influence your writing or did it? Oh, boy, did it ever, Patrick. Thank you for asking that. Uh, I was on the board of the William Inge uh, Theater Festival for close to 20 years. And um, my mother was one of Inge's foremost actresses. I mean, he wrote The Dark at the Top of the Stairs for her. Uh, she was kind of his muse. He he had uh, her picture up over his desk. Uh, she was the original Rosemary and Picnic. And um, they were... He was a very complex man, but they were friends as much as one could be friends with him. And um, I, for those of you who don't know, the Inge Festival, uh, they honor a world-class American playwright every year. And being on the board, I mean, I would get to hang out with, and you know, and sometimes interview uh, people like Neil Simon, Stephen Sondheim, um, uh, David Henry Huang, uh, Beth Henley. I mean, it was incredible. And uh, and because of getting to know some of those people, that, that was one of the things that certainly first inspired me to be a playwright. And then I actually wrote a book during uh, the pandemic called The Art of Writing Through the Theater. And um, it's basically, it, it's sort of an, in, it's, you know, too advanced for most of your guests here, but it's an introductory book to uh, criticism, playwriting, and uh, and script analysis. And I'm happy to say it's done very well. And one of the incredible things about that is through some of the people I met through the Inge Festival uh, and other people that I, I just reached out to, in addition to the how-to sections, it includes uh, interviews with 18 world-class playwrights, librettists, uh, lyricists. I mean, um, uh, everybody from uh, the people I mentioned, Marsha Norman, David Lindsay Abair, David Zippel, um, uh, Octavio Solis. I, I'm very, very proud of that book, and it's uh, it, it's. I, I also teach from it as well, so it's it's been it's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, it's a great read. <laughs> Thank you, um, Karen uh, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Would you like to turn on? Can you turn on your mic and ask your question? Yeah, I think I can finally turn on my mic. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you did it? Yeah, you did it's it. you good. Okay. Yahoo. Uh huh. Okay. I don't know if you can see me, but I think my uh, video's off. But we can hear you, uh, Karen. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, this was wonderful. I enjoyed it so so much. Um, <laughs> yeah. I my question was, what surprised you most in writing this current play, Marilyn, Mom and Me? Uh, was there? Thank yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, I, I think I sort of answered that, but I, I'm happy to elaborate uh -huh. on it. As I said, I started out to write a play about my mother in Marilyn. Uh -huh. I wound up writing a play about my mother and me. And and mm -hmm. then it became sort of a balancing act of uh, which I believe I've finally achieved of going back and forth between uh, mm -hmm. Marilyn and Eileen and Luke and Eileen. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that, I, that makes me want to ask you a question. Karen, you can stay. Don't don't go away. But okay. uh, how how much time did you get to spend with Marilyn Monroe? How did you get to meet her much? I no, I didn't at all. I wasn't born yet when my mother did bus stop. Oh, okay. And, yeah, and and so, but again, I mean, I just I heard all the stories, and um, uh, and again, you know, pieced together other things. I I think getting back to Karen's question, the thing that surprised me the most was how many similarities there were between these two women oh. who seem like they could not be more different. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and, and the thing that I realized is that, you know, if someone looked at Marilyn, and, and this is an oversimplification, but if somebody looked at Marilyn sideways, she would burst into tears. If somebody looked at my mother sideways, she would tell them to go fuck themselves and light another cigarette. <laughs> but it was both the same thing. same thing. They were both suffering from that feeling of insecurity, that feeling like they were never enough, that mm. feeling like, as I said earlier, for all they achieved because of the fact that they were both adopted, they never truly felt like they deserved a place at the table. And the other thing that I discovered was that this was when Marilyn was the biggest star in the world and she wanted what my mother had. She wanted a stable marriage, she wanted kids and she wanted to be taken seriously as a legitimate actress. And so, you know, for all she achieved, it was, you know, the whole thing of the grass is always greener. Mm -hmm. mm, that's fascinating. I just was going to say that I, I remember reading somewhere that Arthur Miller once said, 
that he didn't, when he was writing a play, he didn't know what the play was going to be about until he was about two thirds through it. I, I believe that's fairly accurate. And I'm just thinking about your saying that, you know, you didn't realize until you wrote that the play was about or that, you know, these two women were so similar. I mean, yeah. it's just that process of discovery, I think, that is one Absolutely. of the things that's fascinating. One of, my favorite, one, of one of my we favorite, all go through as writers. Yeah, yes. one of my favorite quotes is I write to find out what I'm thinking. Yeah. I love that. Whose quote is that? I think it's Richard Wil Wilbur. Or it, I think it's yeah. it's it's Richard it's Richard Wilbur or Richard Wright. I always get confused that they're so different. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, um, some of you probably know yeah. uh, Jack Batman, the Tony winning producer. Who's yeah, he's a good friend of ours. He's on my advisory yes, board. Of course he is. Of course uh -huh. he is. Yes, yeah. of course. Uh, when I first came to True, I, yes, Jack was uh, uh, was one of my sponsors. But um, when Jack saw uh, the first New York reading I did of the play, he said, you didn't write a play about your mother and Marilyn. You wrote a play about your mother and you. Who are you kidding? <laughs> sounds exactly <laughs> like Jack. The truth of the matter is it's about both of them or all three of them. But uh, but yeah, I mean, that wasn't what I started off to do. And that's where I wound up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. That was great. Thank you. And uh, Amy, Amy Sola is saying, I never know what I think until I hear what I say. I, 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 mm -hmm. who, Amy, who is that? Is that is that you or is that someone else? Um did you make major changes to the script? That's, okay. that's me. That's me, Bob. But probably other people have said it as well. No, I will always call it an Amy Stoller quote. I will. <laughs> I will always do that. Um, Jeff Westfield, did you want to come in and just say uh, your your question? Sure. Hi, Bob. Uh, thanks, Luke. Incredible stories. Thank I you. I love Jeff. that bad seed. I'm surprised you didn't name your memoir "The Good Seed." <laughs> actually but, that's uh, that's pretty clever that would be, that would be. <laughs> there's the sequel oh, thanks Bob. <laughs> i put it in my stand-up routine um but i am curious how much you know you did you do some major stage readings and then decide i gotta revamp this whole thing and yeah. go back to square this one is, this is a room that would be interested in the process and the, the table well, read to stage reading to great, great. It's um, I, I was directing a, a a children's theater show in the summertime as a favor to a friend, and it was something. It so I I you know out of loyalty to my friend, I won't say what it was, but it was something I particularly didn't want to be directing, but I was doing it as a favor to her, and they were paying me decently, and which never hurts, and so. But the whole time that I was commuting, because one does that like crazy on the west coast. To do this play, um, I was thinking, all right, I can't wait to finish this damn show so I can hole up at my place in Palm Springs and write this Marilyn Monroe play. So I, I spent the whole summer commuting, listening to audiobooks of biographies about Marilyn. And uh, as I was saying, oh, to Karen, oh, that's a similarity. Oh, I'd never thought about that. Oh, okay, that 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 makes sense. So when I sat down to write the first draft, I wrote it. I wrote the first draft in three days. It just kind mm -hmm. of poured out of me. And I it was the heat of, it was like August in Palm Springs. So it was 115 degrees outside. So you don't dare go outside. So I just stayed in and wrote and wrote and wrote. And then I was, uh, since I'm also a college professor, you know, this was early August. And I was determined to have a reading in uh, my clubhouse where I live before I started back to school. And I started back to school on something like um, uh, August 23rd. We, we start back very early. So, so before I even hold up in Palm Springs, I sent, and, and this is something when I interviewed um, uh, Stephen Adley Gerges that he talked about, uh, I sent invitations out to, to friends saying on, I started on 23rd. And so I said, on Sunday, the 22nd of August, come for brunch and a play reading in our clubhouse. So I invited people before I'd even written play. <laughs> and 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 you know, Stephen Adley Gerger says he does that sometimes. It's like, so, okay, I was up against the deadline. So I wrote the play in three days. I spent the next two weeks sort of tinkering with it and casting, et cetera. And then I had the reading the day before I started back to school. 
because I was determined to have a first reading before I, I started back to school. And because it deals with my mother's death at the end and, and it, it's, you know, I'm sitting there and of course, you know, as I'm sure all of you know, it's like you hear that, that, that first reading, you're at that point of, I don't know what the hell I have. Is this any good or not? So the play ends and the room is, is dead silent. I thought, oh shit. <laughs> and then I looked around and I realized they were all sobbing. Uh -huh. And I so then then, you know, slowly the comments people started coming up and people were saying how moving it was and how honest and how raw and how vulnerable and how, you know, how brave of me to expose myself in that way. So I kept rewriting and shopping it around and doing workshops and renting theater spaces and places like the Stella Adler Studio in L.A., uh, had a couple of readings in New York and for some producers and such, and then uh, had a just had a full production, you know, uh, as I mentioned at the Equity Theater here in uh, here in Long Beach near where um, I live. So let me ask you this: uh, You said that you you started doing rewrites. How extensive were the rewrites? Uh, were, the, were was it detail stuff? Was it specific words? Was it lines? Or was it was it whole pieces where you went? It would work better. I I've now heard it. I think it would work better if I did did something else. Did you change much? I did change a great deal. For one thing, adding the uh, African American uh, character. Somebody in in the text posted something about Rosetta Lenoir, uh, and Rosetta was Mom's best friend for, as I said, like more than forty years, and uh, she was one of the few people because my mother, as we spoke earlier about Ruth Mitchell, my mother was such a tough cookie and and kind of scared a lot of people, but <laughs> me included at times. But um, uh, Rosetta was one of the few people, my mother's nickname in the business was Hecky, and Rosetta was one of the few people who could go, Hecky, cut the shit. And mom would go, oh, okay. <laughs> so so I felt it was important to have her in there. Uh, and I, the story I told about Ella Fitzgerald, initially I just talked about that story, but now I had an actress, an African-American actress who could play both Ella Fitzgerald and Rosetta. So that was a major change. And also... Finding the balance between the Maryland stories and the Luke stories and Eileen with both of them. So uh, that took a little, you know, just take this away, add that, et cetera. So uh, again, you know, I, I like all of you, I'm sure all you writers out there, it's just, you know, keep tinkering and keep changing until it works. Well, thank you, Luke. I think um, I think I'm going to end now because uh, we're <laughs> later than we usually go. Well, I'm actually, sure. lately we've been going until seven o'clock. So do, I'm, I'll be completely honest with you. I just I just want to have dinner first. Um, so uh, thank you all uh, for coming today, everybody out in the room, um, Stephanie and and all. Uh, I'm going to go into uh, speaker view now, guys. So keep your keep your audio off. And I wanted to say thank you to YouTube viewers and podcast viewers if you happen to stumble upon us. Uh, welcome to True. This is what who we are and what we do. Uh, if you like it, come back with us every week. Um, next week, we're going to have an interesting conversation with Brent Buell, who uh, has yeah. brought theater into prisons. And wow. um, as a result of the work that he's been doing, uh, a film, a major film has just been made about his work, starring Coleman Domingo um, mm -hmm. and uh, Paul Ross Rossi. Uh, to uh, Oscar nominees. So there's a lot going on for, for uh, Brent. We're, we're going to have another kind of conversation like I had with Luke today about, about Brent, uh, Brent's specific uh, experiences and what he does and why he does it. Um, and then uh, I'm going to be getting the schedule together for April, May, June, July. I don't know. Right now, I'm, I'm going to plan until about 2029. Uh, and uh, hopefully have a schedule together soon. Um, so come back and be with us. Uh, if you're out there and you don't know us uh, and you want to actually come and be in the room and ask questions like you heard people ask today, um, just email me at trunltd at aol.com. That's trunltd at aol.com. I'll invite you every week. We'd be happy to have you and get you into, into the community and be part of us. Um, we have been doing this as a community service since COVID started in 2020. April 17th, 2020 is when we started doing this. Um, so we we still welcome people. They can come for free. Um, but if you can um, pay a little something to come and, and be with us, that would always help us. 
And also, if you join as a member, that would be really helpful as well. Um, takes money to keep going. It's just, you know, it yeah. just does. It's one of those realities. So uh, thank you again. Thank you, community, everybody who was in, in the room today. Happy, uh, thank, you, thank you to everybody out there. And uh, Luke, thank you very much for being with us and for being so open and honest and enlightening on, pleasure, in many, on many levels. So, My great pleasure. Thank you.